Okay, let's start. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to our uh, seminar, uh, Programming Languages and Program Analysis Lab. Short, uh, uh, yeah, so this is the beginning of uh, a series of seminars, uh, which will be here in uh, on uh, Constructor University Bremen ca campus uh, three times. Like we will try to do it uh, on Mar in March, in the beginning of March, and also in May. Uh, uh, yeah. So yeah, let's begin. So our first speaker, Azat Abdulin. Yeah. So yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Azad, and today I'm going to be talking about our project KEX, which we use to generate, automatically generate tests for uh, Java programs. And uh, I think if you have any questions during my speech, you can just raise a hand or uh, give me any other clue that you want to ask something, and I will address you at, uh, at a convenient time so that we don't forget all our questions. So yeah, uh, let's begin. This is a short outline of what I'm going to be talking about today. First, I will give a quick introduction to uh, program analysis methods that are called symbolic execution and concolic testing, so that we everyone understand what's going on. What's going on. Then I will give an overview of KEX, uh, KEX as a platform and KEX as a tool for generating tests. And then I will briefly talk about our ongoing projects related to text and uh, summarize our future plans. But yeah. First, let's begin with some type of classification of program analysis methods, because that's what you should do at the beginning of a talk. Uh, I chose this uh, classification. It's basically a division uh, on of program analysis methods based on how much they know about the program they try to analyze. Uh, the simplest ones are black box uh, program, black box methods because they just treat your program as a black box. They just shove some inputs into it and try to see what happens. And uh, the uh, most uh, complicated and most powerful methods are called white box. Uh, analysis methods because they have full information about your program, like uh, compiled sources, uh, just source files, uh, all the dependencies, anything that comes to mind is known to a white box tool. And uh, uh, obviously, the simpler the analysis, it's the faster it is. So black box tools usually are very fast, and they are not very capable, but white box tools uh, work slowly and require a lot of resources, but can do potentially much more. So yeah, today we'll be focusing on white box analysis methods, uh, which I mentioned before, symbolic execution and concolic testing. So let's start with the symbolic execution. Uh, if symbolic execution is basically a method of program analysis that tries to execute it somehow abstractly. Uh, it takes your program, it assigns all the inputs that your program takes to some symbolic values, and then it step by step, it uh, uh, follows every instruction of your program and just symbolically computes how these instructions affect your program state. And based on this uh, one symbolic state, you can which basically can correspond to many concrete execution states. You can then ask some queries, check some properties of your program, etc. And yeah, uh, in short, why is symbolic execution good? Because in the perfect world, uh, it will give you a complete understanding of all possible program states, and you can basically do any kind of program analysis using symbolic execution, and it will give you uh, perfect results. And uh, uh, although we don't live in a perfect world and symbolic execution has a lot of problems, it still 
used in many cases, like automatic test generation, which I will be focusing today, uh, bug detection, crash reproduction, etc., etc. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, try some example just to see how it how everything works. We have a simple function uh, in Java which takes two integer values and uh, performs some operations. And we can see that one of the execution paths of this program uh, may lead to exception. Uh, let's try to see how symbolic execution can find uh, this uh, exception. So yeah, at the start, we just have uh, symbolic inputs and that's it. And then at each step of the execution, we just perform all the necessary uh, operations just symbolically and store the resulting values. For example, we remembered that variables x and y somehow uh, computed from inputs a and b. And then we reached our first uh, condition, first if. And uh, basically at this at branching point, uh, we uh, should split into two uh, basically two paths of analysis. Our one symbolic state that we computed before the if basically copies and one copy will correspond to a true branch of this if, other copy will correspond to a false branch of this if. And uh, yeah, each symbolic state not only, not only stores the values of all the variables but also stores something called path condition. Basically path condition is a set of conditions that are that correspond to this exact symbolic state. So yeah, uh, let's try to analyze uh, when we reach the line that interests us, the line that throws an exception, we can see what will be our symbolic state and what will be our path condition. So. What do we do with it? How can we use this symbolic state to do uh, any uh, checks or test generation? To use that, we to do that, we use something called SMT solvers, or SM, basically SMT problem, and SMT solvers are the tools that try, allow you to solve this problem. Uh, basically, if any of you know what uh, SAT problem is, SMT is like SAT, but more powerful. Because SAT is basically a problem of formula satisfiability over some Boolean logic, and SMT is a problem of satisfiability of given formula over some theories. And theories in case of SAT, in case of SMT, is basically like data types. For example, you have theory of integers, theory of arrays, etc., and you have some formulas that use integers and arrays and operations on them and they all together uh, build some type of satisfiability problem that you can try to solve. And yeah, when formula is satisfiable, the SMT solver will give you a the model. Basically, it's a set of values that will lead your formula to be satisfiable. Uh, yeah, so let's try to see how it works on some on our symbolic state that we built before. Uh, so basically, in the middle, you can see a small and simple SMT formula that uses integral theory and expresses basically our symbolic state. And uh, by building this formula and by asking SMT solver to check it for satisfiability, we can see that this formula is unsatisfiable. And this may lead you to believe that the first example that we saw was actually unreachable, so our program was correct. But actually, integers in SMT, they are not like integers in our programming languages, because in programming languages, we have basically bit vectors. Uh, so integer is a uh, set of 32 small Boolean variables that can be one or zero. And there is overflowing and, uh, well, yeah, etc. So properties of bit vectors not exactly correspond to properties of usual integers. So we usually in symbolic execution use theory of bit vectors to model the behavior of integer variables. 
And uh, well, basically, formula looks almost exactly, exactly the same, but just operations called a little bit differently. And in this case, we can see that solver can solve this uh, formula and give us the model. Uh, model for this, yeah, I think this is, uh, this should be A and B. I just uh, confused the names of, of the variables. So yeah, basically if we put A equal to this first number and B equal to the second number, uh, our program will throw an exception because there was an integer overflow. Yeah, so. Using this SMT formula, SMT solver, we can use our symbolic states to compute some properties of a program, and it all looks simple and fun, but actually the real world is more complicated. And as soon as you introduce some more complex language constructions like abstract method, methods, virtual calls, or anything else, the problem becomes much harder. Because, like in this case, uh, we have, for example, two abstract functions, and that means that we just can't understand exactly what will be the values of x and y in this slide. And to do that, we actually need to just scan all the uh, class paths that we have, find all the possible implementations of these two methods, and basically each implementation will lead to a new branch in our symbolic execution tree, and the number of, of states will grow exponentially. And this is one of the main problems of SMT because or of symbolic execution, because the real world problems have a lot of possible execution paths, and in many cases they are infinite, and you just can't fully analyze the program to prove some properties that you are interested in. And actually everything can get even worse because, like in this example, we have just native calls for the function. <coughs> and with this case, you just can't do anything. Basically, you can't express a native, native call in any way in symbolic state or SMT, and just your symbolic execution engine will give you any random results that you can't use. And unfortunately, this often happens because you may not think about it, but when you write programs in Java, very often somehow your lines lead to some symbolic calls that are native and you just uh, symbolic execution doesn't, doesn't work. Yeah, so to summarize what are the main challenges of symbolic execution, one of the main challenges as I mentioned before is path explosion. Real world pro programs have a lot of uh, execution paths and it just requires a lot of uh, system memory and a lot of time to analyze all of, the, all of them and you just can do it anyway. And uh, other problems is just resource, uh, symbolic execution is resource intensive, it's uh, very complex to compute and so that's why it takes a lot of time uh, to perform. And also you have some environment interactions or external external libraries that you cannot resolve and uh, with this uh, language constructs you just uh, sometimes simple ex execution just fails you and you don't know what to do but there is there are some solutions to this problem for example with path explosion one of the main uh, way how people address this, this problem is using something called path, selector, path selectors. Uh, basically what it means, at each step of your analysis you have this huge set of paths that you can, or path or symbolic states that you can explore. And you have usually a limited time to do so because you just can't run infinitely. And path selection algorithms basically try to somehow predict which of the paths that you have you currently have are the best for analysis for example they reach the statement that you want to reach or they prove or disprove the property that you are interested in they just prioritize it somehow and they don't solve the path explosion problem but they mitigate it and also does path merging 
Basically, the idea of path merging is when you have two symbolic states that are very similar but differ like in one condition or uh, one uh, statement or something like that. You just can merge them and add this uh, contradiction as a branching inside a single executable path. And it does not work uh, like always, but it can help. And with the problems like uh, <laughs> And uh, um, environment interactions, basically all you can do is just try to mock them somehow. And uh, here's where we ca come to concolic testing, because concolic testing tries to solve some of these problems of symbolic execution. So let's try to understand what, does, what it does. Uh, basically, concolic testing is a way to combine symbolic execution with concrete execution. The idea is that you basically generate some random input data for, for a start, and you run your program under tests using these uh, random inputs. And during this, uh, the concrete execution, you also collect the symbolic state that will correspond to this execution. And uh, after that, you have a symbolic state, you have a path condition in, in, in that symbolic state, and you can uh, choose one of the terms of path condition and try to negate that term to lead, to basically uncover a new path in your program that you try to analyze. Uh, and uh, concurrent testing does, does that e Iteratively, so at each step, it just selects one of the symbolic states, chooses one path condition in that state, and tries to negate it and uncover a new path. Uh, and what also one of the points of concurrent testing that it can use information for you, from your concrete, concrete execution to improve the results of symbolic execution. And we will try to see how can that happen. Yeah, but. First, basically this slide summarizes what I said before. Uh, Concolic testing is a way to solve some of the challenges of, uh, of symbolic execution. So it uh, allows you to do better and more effective path exploration and can do, allows you to use some concrete values during symbolic execution. So, uh, new example, basically similar to what we've seen before, only one native call that we can't resolve. And so, uh, let's imagine that Concolic Testing Engine decided to analyze this function, generated some random input data, and uh, collected this concrete trace. Uh, basically, it's all similar to symbolic execution, but we also have concrete values for all the variables of our program. And we have only one term in our path condition that corresponds to this if statement. Next, we want to uncover some new path in this program. So what we do, we select the term in our path condition and try to negate it. And this results in a state that you see on the slide uh, the problem is you still can't do anything with, that, with it because you have a native call. Uh, so the idea of concolic testing is that you can use some of the concrete values to basically re replace anything that you cannot resolve in a symbolic mode. So in this case, we don't know what is, uh, what is function first and what it does. But we know from our concrete execution that if you put value 100, 126 in our function, it will result in value equal to 22. So let's just replace all of these the concrete values and try to somehow solve it. And this will lead to a new state, which is much simpler. Uh, it does not have any unresolvable calls, and we can just put it into SMT Solver and uncover a path that wasn't uh, covered before. And again, in theory, that works really well. In practice, that doesn't work uh, that simple because 
as soon as you introduce objects, uh, some complex relation between objects, memory, etc., uh, just understanding what parts of the program you can replace with concrete values becomes much harder. Um, yeah. Sorry. Uh, could you, uh, I, I'm a bit confused. So uh, you had a pop condition that 22 should be greater than 126 plus plus B, and mm -hmm. then you uh, get like B being 52. So the pop condition doesn't hold. Yeah, I think this is uh, again my mistake. Uh, these concrete values correspond to the execution that we had before. So basically, uh, at this step, we should just forget about the concrete values because we got a new symbolic state that we try to solve. And the concrete values correspond to previous execution that we, we just can throw them away. Uh, okay. could, could you please go back um, a bit? Yeah. Uh, so, uh -huh. so we had like two symbolic executions and we got some concrete values. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, could you please explain yeah. one, one more what we do here? Yeah, so basically, we uh, executed our program concretely, collected this symbolic state, and collected the concrete values that correspond to the variables. Uh -huh. After that, Concolic Engine tries to discover a new path. Uh -huh. It does so by choosing one of the terms in path condition and negating it, so uh -huh. that we will go to a new path in the program. Uh -huh. So basically, here we only have one term, and we negate it. Uh, after that, basically, these concrete values are already not so, um, do, do not correspond basically to this new state. We knew, we basically know that during this execution, we had this native call, mm -hmm. and we know what we put in it, what we got from it. And basically, uh, here we have the same native call, and we say, let's replace this native call with the values that we had before mm -hmm. and uh, try to solve the symbolic state with these new substituted values. So, yeah, here we, we get a new state and everything that's under here is basically not valid anymore. I just forgot to remove it. Mm -hmm. So it's basically Yeah. Uh, so, so, like, in the end we just discovered this path condition for, for like, Okay, so it's just extra uh, restrictions on B, uh, even though like some part of the state is uh, concrete. Yeah, so we basically uh, discovered by that by th fixing the value of A, we can solve this new state. So in this version, we fixed the value of A, told that uh, we only have one symbolic variable now, mm -hmm. and uh, solved the state and got the, the results that we are interested in. Mm -hmm. And then we may, if we want, try to refine B as well, and then we'll get some concrete values which corresponds to the path, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, basically, concurrent testing is like symbolic execution, but with features like that. Mm -hmm. But, and it solves some of the challenges of symbolic execution, but still has lots of them, like path explosion is still a valid problem because we still have a lot of paths, etc. And also, it, it may introduce some new challenges. For example, with this substitu substitution, like in the example that we've seen, it's simple on the examples, especially with integers and primitives. But as I said, as soon as you introduce uh, like collections, collections of maps of objects of etc., you just can't easily determine that you can fix the this part of the symbolic state and just continue the analysis other way. So it's interesting, but it's not always applicable. Yeah, and uh, as you can see, uh, some of the challenges are, I think, quite understandable. Like if you have a program that is somehow random, concurrent execution will just uh, couldn't do anything with it because each time you execute, it will produce a new symbolic state and it will be confusing. And uh, yeah, the last problem, that uh, considering that we use instrumentation to collect symbolic state during the execution, we can introduce some overhead. In my experience, it's not uh, impactful in the real world, but in some cases, it may be. 
Yeah. So if uh, so, so again, yeah. may I just ask if it's possible to extend the uh, conflict testing for concurrency? Uh, I haven't heard about that. I think it it may be possible, but it's I think it's quite possible. like any analysis of concurrent programs. Uh, you have to consider a lot of different paths and a lot of variations of all the interactions. So I think in theory it's possible how much it is applicable, it's hard to say, especially uh, considering that you, even in the static mode, you can just see all the different execution variations of the executions. You can control how the program will execute when you will actually run it. So, yeah. Uh, the main objective of concolic uh, testing is to uh, discover some paths of the program and preconditions on them which were not uncovered by t uh, like testing, right? Uh, yeah, basically, both symbolic execution and concolic testing, they just try to discover all the paths in your program because mm -hmm. the more you know about your program, the more you can just test and prove, etc. And uh, the main point of concolic testing that it allows you to do so more more effectively, mm -hmm. because uh, just you cover a lot of the program by just concrete execution, and you don't have to go. You can do you can explore all the paths faster because you will cover a lot of them just by executing the program completely and collecting. But uh, does it mean that we need to have some unit tests uh, in our program to be able to use concurrent testing? Uh, not necessarily, because, for example, in Kex, we just, for initial seed, we just generate a random data and that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, as always, I think the better you have initial seeds, the better will be the results. So mm -hmm. if you have some unit tests, it will really, it can really help the concurrent testing, but you can do so. We can just put some default values at the start and see what happens. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Uh, so if we have some understanding of the underlying techniques, let's uh, talk a little bit about Kex. Kex is what we call a platform for analysis of JVM byte code, but we mainly focus on automatic test generation and we try to maximize the branch coverage criteria during our test generation. And yeah, basically Kex works uh, on using symbolic execution and concurrent testing. We have both modes, so we can run just purely symbolically or uh, in mixed mode, but in this talk I'll be mainly focusing on concurrent testing. Yeah, and uh, about user guidance, yeah, we have some libraries that allows you to somehow provide more information to Kex about uh, some checks, some assumptions, etc. If you want somehow, and uh, XRT, I think it's not like a user guidance, but it's important part of the analysis because it's basically our mock of Java, some collections from Java standard library that allow us to do more effective analysis because analyzing real collections from Java can be really hard. Yeah, so let's start with an overview. Here basically you can see three main layers of Kex because it takes a set of compiled classes as an input. After that it builds a bytecode representation that we call KFG because the library that we use to do so is called KFG. And uh, in this bytecode level, we can do some transformations, modifications, we can do instrumentation, etc. After that, we convert this bytecode representation into our intermediate representation called predicate state, which is basically equivalent of symbolic state in these examples before. And uh, yeah, again, we can use do some transformations, modifications, verifications in this symbolic state. And after that, we can uh, send 
transfer, convert a predicate state into a simple formula and check uh, some constraints that we want. And the results of SMT solver basically will then somehow convert are converted in the necessary artifacts depending on our, on our use case. For example, in case of test generation, they are, they are converted into generated tests. But if we want, for example, uh, some bug detection, we can convert it into a report. Yeah. So now let's have a brief look at each of these levels, uh, program representation levels. So KFG, as I said before, uh, is basically our library for building control flow graphs for Java bytecode. We just needed control flow graphs because working with pure Java bytecode is not very convenient. So yeah, it's uh, simple as that. And KFG allows us to do basically a lot of analysis and modifications with bytecode, as I said before. Uh, mainly, I think now we use it for instrumentation because at the current stage of text we don't need any more bytecode transformations. Uh, yeah. Is it some external library? Uh, it's external from Kex, but it's also our library. Mm -hmm. We wrote speci specifically for Kex. Yeah. Uh, next uh, representation is predicate state. As I said before, it's basically equivalent of symbolic state from the examples before, and we use it as a uh, interlayer between bytecode and SMT because sometimes we want to add some information to uh, to a symbolic state. Uh, yeah, we want to add some information to our analysis, but we don't want to do it at the bytecode level because uh, creating a correct correct bytecode can be just more complicated, and we want, don't want to do it at the SMT level because working with SMT is also just more complicated. So this is some symbolic equivalent, and it basically corresponds to the usual instructions from the KFG, and you can see also here, we try to separate uh, what we called before in the example symbolic state, basically, each line starting with S is uh, basically a line that builds our state, that modifies memory or initializes some variables. And each line starting with P is basically our path condition. And path conditions somehow depend on the variables declared in the symbolic state itself. Uh, yeah. And the last state is I wanted to talk a little bit about how we actually represent our programs in SMT because it's not that simple. Uh, first of all, SMT is basically just for solving mathematical formulas. It doesn't know anything about programs, about memory, about mutability, etc. It only has primitives, arrays, and some other theories. But in our case, we only use primitives and arrays. And uh, I want to show how we basically represent our programs in SMT. So again, let's consider another example. Here, we construct some uh, uh, array list that is, has two elements, and we have some requirements for the values of those elements. And let's see how this array, or how this array list can be represented in SMT. Uh, uh, we have uh, basically, we use something we call a property memory model. Uh, each reference object in our, uh, from the original program, like objects or array, etc., uh, is basically like a 32-bit pointer. Uh, and each property or each field of the original object that we uh, have some constraints is represented, is stored in a separate array. So we have separate array for all the fields element data of 
array list for all the fields of size, etc. And basically, if you want to express some constraints on the property size of our variable list, we basically take this array and use list as an index in this array. And we don't fix any concrete values of these pointers, so SMT solver re resolves the pointers himself, itself. And uh, that way we also don't have to think a lot about aliasing, how pointers can be equal or not equal, etc. And uh, yeah, uh, basically, if we have some primitive properties, they are stored exactly in the array, like here. Uh, size is a primitive property, we store just its value. Uh, if we have some more complicated properties, like element data here, in our case, it's an array, and arrays are represented also through SMT arrays, and we need to store them somehow, so we store them in a separate array, and uh, yeah, I'm not sure that my explanation makes everything much simpler, but I hope that the overall structure can be understood from the picture. So maybe if you will have some questions, I will answer them later, but uh, for now, let's continue. We also, uh, I think the important point is that we also model the type information in the SMT formula. And it's really important because uh, it allows us to do all the check, to model actually all the type checks and all the type constraints that can appear in the program. And it also helps with aliasing. And uh, I think I have a slide about that a little bit later, so, so I will talk. So yeah, uh, basically how it works. On the previous slides, you have seen just one version of the memory state. But during the analysis of our program, the states of the memory can change because programs somehow change the memory. So we basically, for each instruction that somehow modifies the memory, we create a new new memory state and uh, it's it can be it complicates the analysis a little bit because the more states the more complicated formula is and the SMT solver will just have more time thinking and can yeah can just uh, time out etc but the upside is that we actually have access to full memory state at each step of the execution and it can be really useful. Uh, in practice, we usually use two memory states. Uh, the initial one, because after all the formula is solved, the initial states basically stores, holds the values, the input values that we need to generate our test. And we also use the final memory state because it can be useful, for example, for generating oracles or uh, yeah, just understanding at which state the program has f failed, for example. Yeah. And a little bit about types. So, as I said, we encode all the type information into our uh, formula. Uh, how we do it? First, we just scan our symbolic state or our program and extract all the types that appear in the program somehow. In this case, for example, we have five types. And we assign each type some unique uh, power of two value. And we associate each pointer also with a value in the type property array. And uh, we add some restrictions for this type value. Basically, we say that a variable can have only one type. So we say that the value stored in this array should be also a power of two. And if during the execution we encounter some type constraints, for example, the instance of checks, cast checks, etc., we add this, express these constraints using this 
just bit vector values, for example, it's not really informative for a program, but if somehow if someone decided to check that x a variable x is instance of object, we just encode this uh, constraint uh, in this form. We just take all the subtypes that are related to the type we check, and we say that our type should be one of them, basically. Uh, yeah. Also, I think I didn't mention that somehow in our examples we have a type called kex util java util list array list. Uh, this is what I mentioned at the start of this section, just that we, in Kex, we use our mocks of standard library that just simplify the analysis. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so, uh, as far as I understand, type is um, just an integer field, but what if the method has more than 32 types inside? Uh, it's not... Uh, the byte vector, the vector that ah, is okay, the, okay, the okay. Is Thank you. So, we, if we have a hundred types, we will have a byte bit vector of length 100. Uh, because uh, SMT allows you to create bit vectors of any type you want, of any length you want. So, we just analyze the program and see how many types we have. Mm, thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, so next, as I said before, SMT solver returns us the SMT model, which looks. Sorry, sorry, yeah. I ask about types. Yeah. One question. What do you do about generics? Uh, about generics, basically, we don't do anything because there are no generics in bytecode. In bytecode. Yeah. But uh, for example, if a original program had generics, and uh, let's see with this example. For example, this call uh, will result in on the bytecode level that we read an object from uh, an array of list, of variable list, and then we cast this object into a point. Mm -hmm. And this cast will be an instruction in bytecode, and using these our type constraints, we actually will result that the variables in the array should be uh, of type points. Nice. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So to SMT model, uh, basically, SMT model looks like something like this. It's just a lot of assignments, a lot of values that you get, and at this step, step, we basically need to revert everything that we did previously to encode the program into SMT formula to decode the results back. Uh, and uh, after this decoding, we get something that we call descriptors. Uh, basically, descriptors are just some representation of Java objects that we use in Kex. They are useful to express any property of an object that we want. And we can say that the descriptor is basically the main result of a symbolic engine that Kex uses. This descriptor is then can be converted into anything that we want. For example, in the uh, concolic testing mode, we convert it into tests. And I will talk about that a little later. Um, yeah. So after the after we look had a look at all the main program and presentation levels of Kex, let's quickly analyze how concolic mode in Kex works. Uh, basically, the idea is simple. We just get a method. We somehow generate initial trace for this method. And after that, in a loop, we just execute a test, collect symbolic state, uh, choose one of the new states, and send it to SMT, etc. So uh, the whole concolic mode, as I mentioned it before, when we or talking about it. Uh, interesting, interesting thing about Kex is that it can make basically uh, keep. Uh, this is just one concolic engine that works, and we in Kex can uh, simultaneously run multiple concolic engines 
both on a single method or on a multiple methods of, of a program. And uh, considering that the bottlenecks of basically symbolic execution and control testing are SMT and uh, 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 execution, just execution of a test, we can just in parallel analyze several methods simultaneously and it really improves our results. Yeah, and in this di diagram we basically covered this part of how SMT works, so we wanted to quickly take a look at uh, other three main stages of concurrent execution. Uh, this part is not very interesting as I mentioned before when Anton asks, we just use a random object generator to generate this initial trace. Uh, so yeah. I think there's a problem. Yeah. Uh, in Kex we currently use something that we call coverage-based path se selector. Uh, we tried very various different path selector implementations, and for now we stopped in this one. Basically, at each step of the execution, we built an execution graph of the program, at, and at each step we try to select a new path that is closest to the interesting intra instructions. And I don't think that you can understand what's on this image, but I hope you can uh, understand different colors. So basically, for example, if we say that the orange colors are instructions that are already covered by concrete execution, so basically a, a concrete state, the greenish uh, instructions are instructions of a target method that we want to cover. And uh, yeah, we basically analyze our concrete state, analyze what symbolic states it can produce, and for each uh, symbolic state, we count the distance over this graph to uncovered instructions. And when counting distance, we don't... Basically, the distance is increased only when we somehow encounter an instruction that will require additional checks. For example, if we have branch, we will increase the distance. If we have some field load, for example, it will also increase the distance because usually before field load, you want to check for no, no pointers, etc. But just uh, some plain binary addition instructions, etc., does not increase the coverage. So, yeah, this is what we currently use, and judging by our results, it performs best for things. Yeah. Uh, yeah, one, one more question. Maybe it's a bit general, but I think it's fine to ask it here. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, with like program analysis, one of the like, big problems is that you may get like uh, false positives or mm -hmm. false negatives. Uh, so, I uh, like I, I guess uh, you cannot guarantee absence of false negatives uh, for sure, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, because you may not yes. discover some paths mm -hmm. for some reason, right? Uh, and uh, you don't care about false positives because you just generate tests and then if test fails, then it like, will uh, uh, we'll say that, okay, there is a problem in the program, but uh, it's, it's done separately from the, the part which is done in symbolic execution, right? Yeah, basically, currently, we do not care much about the false positives because uh, we can try to predict them, but we don't can do anything else about them. So, but anyway, like if, if you have some like false positive, it just means that some like you generate a test which may not lead to some path which is yeah, and then, then like actual execution will not go to that direction. Yeah, uh, basically, in most cases, it will result in exactly that that we generate a test that does not go where we want it to go, where we expect it to go. Okay, so then I guess, uh, the, I mean, the problem is kind of still there in the sense that you may make like a very huge set of tests and like like a, like a big chunk of it may be useless in this regard, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we try to address it in one of our current student projects, but I will mention it shortly after. 
Uh, so, also, I, I have a question too. Like, uh, how do you deal with uh, try catch blocks? Like, do you treat any statement inside as a bra branch or do you ignore it? Uh, uh, let me remember. Uh, I think currently we, if we know that the exception has been thrown, for example, we have seen the throw instruction in our uh, concrete trace, or we know that, for example, here we will try to dereference a null pointer. Uh, if we know that the exception will be, will appear, we try to correctly find uh, path we try to currently find a catch, catch statement that will correspond to it. But if it's just some uh, exception that we cannot predict, we just ignore it. For example, if you have some unresolvable uh, I don't know, native call or external call that we don't know that it will throw an exception, we will just ignore the possibility. So. Mm, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so next, a little bit about how we generate tests. Uh, the idea is simple. We just take the descriptors uh, that you have seen before, and using Java reflection, we just create objects and directly access memory and put all the values that we want because, well, because there is no other way, basically. Uh, other approaches are too complicated to use constantly in the well in these types types of tools, and uh, yeah, uh, because we use Java reflection and we don't actually focus on readability, the tests are not really good in terms of quality, but at least they are now give some coverage results. And here I think we have some example of one of the generated tests. Uh, it may not look that horrible, but actually all the horror is inside of this function calls because there is there lies all the reflection. But yeah, basically this is how it looks. We just create instances of objects using reflections and put the concrete values that we want using also reflection. The only difference you can see here is again with the array list. We actually use its public public API to create and modify it. Just because again we in Kex we have our mocks and we know what array list is, so it's easier for us to uh, generate uh, normal looking for code for it. Uh, yeah, and this was a basically setup method that creates all the. Uh, objects and uh, the actual test itself. It's almost similar for all the tests that Kex generates because we just initialize all the necessary variables and call a method using also Java reflection. And yeah, one uh, feature of chat tests that Kex generate is basically for each test, it generates a separate file because First of all, it's easier for the concrete execution that I will talk about later. And also it's just safer because somehow we can produce tests that will not compile. And uh, this way, our only one test fails to compile and not all of them. Because uh, I think we had a, uh, one of the test generating tools called Evasuit recently had uh, problem like that because it generated really good test suite for uh, some benchmark on one of the competitions and produced uh, one error in the test file and basically got uh, zero results because one simple error uh, uh, erased all the other results that it, it, it have achieved. Yeah, and the last part about test execution we uh, use this distribu distributed uh, test executor system. 
because here uh, in Kex we have multiple concordic engines running simultaneously and we actually have a separate process that controls all the test execution and for all, each test executor we also have a separate process because it's also simpler and faster and safer because somehow sometimes test can fail or hang infinitely and we just want to have ability to control them. Yeah, and uh, this is just distributed system. Each concordic engine sends a request for test execution to this controller. It selects one of the three executors and just uh, the executor collects the symbolic trace and returns the result. Uh, yeah, and the controller handles all these all of these problems that I mentioned before, like uh, infinite hanging or failing or etc. It just uh, keeps control and restarts anything that it needs. And uh, the test executor itself is a really simple thing because it just has a class loader that instruments all the classes that are loaded using our KFG library and uh, a trace collector that runs in the background and uh, collects everything that happened during test execution. And all of these results are serialized into a JSON format and sent back as a string. And this all works over just uh, regular TCP sockets, I think, currently. So in theory, we can even distribute it into several uh, machines working in the network. Yeah, uh, this was an overview, overview of how Kex works in uh, Concordic mode. And challenges of Kex basically mirror everything I mentioned before about uh, Concordic testing and symbolic execution. Programs are com complex, so it's hard to analyze them in many cases. Uh, path exploring problem is still a thing. SMT solvers are really uh, uh, resource intensive and they can take a long, a long time. And uh, yeah, tests that we generate, we need to still improve their quality because we want to, in the future, we want to create tests that are more usable in any meaning of usable. Yeah. Uh, just some reference to uh, results of Kex. Uh, for the past four years, we participated in something called SBFT uh, Java Tool Competition, which is basically a competition of tools that automatically generate tests for Java. Uh, and uh, each year, there is uh, organizers create a benchmark from classes from open source projects and run all the tests, all the tools on a 120 second timeout. Yeah, and here are some results of Kex. And you can see a small bump in the year 2023. Basically, this is the first year that we sent our concordic testing mode, concordic testing engine to a competition, and the results were a bit better. We still do not go high on the rankings because the organizers also uh, evaluate coverage metrics, mutant metrics, and test quality metrics in many cases. So we don't do very good in quality, but we still, at least we can do uh, not bad in coverage. And we perform uh, on par with other symbolic execution tools. I consider it good enough or not. Yeah. What coverage does the first place have? Uh, the first place is FSU tool, which I mentioned before. It's a search-based tool, which is basically state-of-the-art in the automatic test generation, not considering LLMs, etc. Uh, I think it varies from 60 to 90. I think closer to 90, closer to 90 in many cases. Okay. Do you see how you can improve your coverage? Uh, I think basically uh, the only way that we can reach the same levels as Eversuit or even higher is a combination of different methods. Mm -hmm. And that's basically one of our future directions 
that we want to try is to see how we can combine texts with different test generation methods to improve both our results and their results. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. I also have a question. Yeah. Are there any plans to integrate the it as a production development software, so to generate tests for real code? Uh, for plugin, yeah, for plugin, we actually have a plugin for Kex. I don't remember what version of Kex it uses, so I'm, I do not recommend using it in any way. But basically, because of all the reasons I've stated above, like with these challenges and the just quality of tests that we generate, basically it's not usable in any way in a production because no nobody wants tests that, first of all, not maintainable and uh, currently don't have any test oracles, etc. So this what is... What application does this have now? Uh, basically only research. Oh, what kind of research? Uh, I will talk a little bit later. Uh, basically, the next section I think is the application, current applications of Kex. Yeah. And then I also have a question, uh, yeah. like, hi, question. Uh, what do you think about the combining like something like Kex with LLMs? So Kex can find values to go deeper in branches and LLM can write readable code. So like we can probably give LLM hints how to reach, uh, how to go deeper, uh, yeah, something that, like this. That's a very interesting idea. And it's also one of the future ideas that we currently have to try to combine these two approaches. Because, yeah, as you said, text can generate input values, LLMs can generate code. Yeah, I, I believe the branch co coverage and all this stuff is good and many people would like to see and to, to have it in production, but the readability is the first, like we can have less, but readable. Yeah, I think readability and uh, overall, uh, how to say it? The oracles, I think, are also important because we, people, I think, I don't know have anything to support it, but I believe that people usually want to want to have tests that actually check something rather than uh, achieve high branch coverage and just do some random stuff that is not related to actual use cases of a program. Sorry, uh, my yeah. also not, I also want to add like an opposite opinion. I mean, <clears throat> I want to ask your opinion, like how is really quality of the tests, like the readability of this test is important because I mean, I mean, tools like Kex, uh, they can produce tests, like I know thousands of tests, yeah, automatically, like the people still, like the people would not be able to, like, you know, review it by hand anyway. So like, why do, why do we even care about this? I mean, we can imagine like a system that just runs on CI, or like on Team City, and just you know constantly uh, tries to you know stress test your program, and like in case it just find any bug, it just it it doesn't matter if the test is readable. I mean, it just should be like reproducible, and like if if this tool like report you some data, or some seed that you can then run locally on your IDE just to debug the program. And after this, like this readability problem becomes irrelevant because oh, I mean, this, this system can generate like thousands of tests. Why, why do we even care? It's, it can generate tests at the, like, you know, uh, at the rate not accessible to humans. That's my point. Yeah, that's an interesting point, but I think, uh, in the current state of things, it's still hard to, uh, for example, f even if Kex will run somewhere or any other tool will, will run in CI and produce lots of tests, uh, I think first problem is actually identifying what tests are bug producing and what we, uh, we should show to the user. And uh, also, I think, 
it comes down to the fact that what will users prefer to just simply write their own tests that will understand how they work and basically write the test suite that they want or rely on some random tool that will produce them lots of different tests and then spend lots of time rewriting these tests and trying to make them somehow supportable. So if, for example, we talk about tools that are mainly focused on some bug detection, for example, I think Cli is one of the most popular tools for uh, C and C++. And I think, I believe, it mainly focuses on like basically end-to-end -end testing. You just, it starts from the main function of the program and tries to discover all the paths and tries to find bugs, basically tries to find fails. And in this case, it may be interesting, uh, but still it depends on how reliable these bug reports will be because if there are no false positive and every bug that the tool produces is really important, then yes, I think it's possible that we don't care about the quality of tests, etc. But in the modern world, it's just not, not, not the case. Did I answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so now I will talk a little bit about the applications of Kex. So this is a uh, sh short about what we tried to apply to before. Uh, the test generation is basically past, present and the future. We just always, uh, it was always our main focus, but we also tried to develop some just, uh, prototypes, sometimes with the help of the students that tries to do some other checks, for example, crash reproduction or bug detection or something else. And uh, basically, we know that we can adapt Kex to these other applications, but as not, it just requires a lot of time to do this adaptation. And, Currently, we don't see the reasons to go to this path. Yeah. Shortly about the projects that are that we have now, I think I will just mention them really shortly because in the future seminars, the people will present them themselves. One of one group of projects that we currently have are this is mainly focused on the quality of tests that we generate currently. So. For example, Andrei Yurko tries to automatically generate test oracles because we don't have them, but they are still important. Uh, Ilya Malakhov tries to use mocking. Uh, the main idea of the project was to mock uh, anything that we couldn't create ourselves, but the potentially we can just try to use mocking everywhere. Maybe mocking will be better than reflection. Uh, yeah, and this last project, I think, a little bit correlates to what Anton asked before. Uh, project by Raman, here we just try to somehow minimize the test you generated by text because we realize that sometimes you can generate a huge test suite and it's basically not usable. What, what if we can just uh, compress it into a smaller that will perform either similarly or almost similarly. Yeah, and these projects, I think there are not so in pure research, it's basically improving what we have now to be more usable. Uh, yeah, and a couple of projects that I think can go to this more pure research uh, uh, area first one is actually finished currently a project by Nias. The idea of a project is to uh, try to generate tests that use only public API objects to basically to create them. It's a really complicated task. It's basically, an, not basically, it's actually undecidable in the general case, but 
in some cases we can try to do something and just write an approach both based on the symbolic graphs and yeah maybe uh, yeah so we just developed an approach and we tested it quite thoroughly and still in some example test cases it can work but unfortunately it's not usable in the real world so currently this is the state of the project and the last project is also quite interesting it's an ongoing project by Rustam uh, this is what I already mentioned uh, he tries to combine Evasute and Kex to basically increase their combined power uh, by somehow hiding weaknesses of each of these tools and uh, yeah, currently we're in the stage of evaluating what we have he has a working prototype but we try to understand is it actually work is is actually yeah, basically it, is it working yeah and a really short about what we will do in the future uh, basically everything you saw on the challenges slide before is a plan for the future because we want to address all these challenges and somehow improve what we have now we no, do not have any concrete ideas for some of them but still we always searching for some, some ideas uh, other direction is integration with the test spark test spark is a plugin developed by our colleagues in ictl lab uh, which is basically a plugin for automatic test generation they currently support llms and uh, evasute and they provide this really uh, helpful uh, user interface to users to interact with in generated tests and uh, we want to integrate kex into them because first of all i think it's just a way to get to get more feedback from people if somehow uh, somebody tries to use it also the guys at the test park actively working on integrating some uh, user statistics uh, collection and it, it will be useful if we will get access to these statistics and uh, basically also like i mentioned before test park i think will be a good platform to do some experimentation with different combinations of all the approaches that we have because it's easy to combine when you already have anything there yeah and the last direction for uh, what we have now is basically using llms because llms are currently everywhere people trying to understand what they can do and what uh, what are they what are they good at and basically we want to do the same yes yeah i think that's it from me thank you if you have any more questions i'm ready, I'm ready to answer them or we can discuss them after <laughs>